Well, great to see you, church. This is a wonderful days in the life and ministry here at First Baptist Church. There are several things happening today, that I think, that you will be uh, of interest to you. One, quite obviously, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together today in our service. I'm always excited and thankful as we come together to remember the sacrifice and the love of our Savior. It's something about when we celebrate the Lord's Supper that I'm, I'm drawn to the words of the disciples and the angels and the testimony of the church and the Gospels as they're going to look for Him that morning on that Lord's Day. They get the message, He is risen. He's risen. And, and that excitement and, and that news just how floods my spirit man as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together today and every time the church has that blessing to do so. Secondly, today we have, a, this is our fifth Sunday. So here at First Baptist, on our fifth Sundays, we call that Faith in Action Sunday. And what that means is we put our faith in action. There are many Sunday school classes that, are, that have been praying and they have a project that they will be working on this afternoon. In essence, we come together as a church body, uh, we eat lunch together or we grab lunch and then we meet together in our church Sunday school classes or groupings. And we're actually the hands and the feet, the eyes and the voice of Jesus. It's not us just coming here together to worship but we're worshiping as we go in and share with those who have needs in our community. It's always great to know that God's called all of us, every member, to be a missionary. That's going to be going on immediately following this service. And if you'd like to be a part of one of those projects, then uh, please see me or one of the staff, and we can help you get plugged in to a class that's going to be going out this afternoon. And uh, so we try to do that every fifth Sunday. And today's another is special as well because tonight we will have a family meeting. A family meeting it means that we gather together, the church family, at 6 o'clock and we'll be hearing the report from our building committee and our church architect in the newest developments in our plans to relocate our ministries to a property off Pete's Highway. That's something this church has made a decision years ago and we're following suit with that. As you see, here's a... One of the slides that will be presented tonight, there will be many slides. I'm only going to give you an overview this morning. I want you to church body to know what's going on and come back tonight because we need your input, your suggestion, your feedback. This is a bird's eye view of what the campus will look like. In front of the pond to the, to the far bottom left would be Pete's Highway. And the next slide we actually begin to see how you come off Pete's Highway to the right, you travel in, go around the pond, there, the worship center is located uh, uh, fronting the pond, and then there's a parking area that we enter in through a, a commons area, and I believe we have a slide of the, yeah, right here, that's the commons area, that little canopy looking thing, well that's not really a canopy, alright, that's a glassed in area, it's where it's going to say, enter here. And all of our guests will enter in through that, that glassed-in area. There will be a welcome center there, some coffee. And to the left of the uh, canopy or the commons area is our worship center. To the right was... Go back to that slide just a second. Good, good, good. To the right you see the children's building. And there's another multi-purpose building for students in, in the back that's not shown in that picture there. All right, let's go to the next slide. And that's a somewhat of a floor plan for the new worship center. You'll see that uh, it has a fan-shaped seating and there are Sunday school classes around the perimeter. So we're excited. And uh, There may be one other slide, I think, or not. Let's see. Nope, no other slides. All right. But uh, you need to come back tonight and see the rest of it. There's the outside view. The, they even have a picture of me preaching inside the new sanctuary. I'm telling you, that's vision. I mean, I'm thankful for that. That means I'm going to be alive for a couple more years anyway, if that comes true. <laughs> and, uh, so tonight, we're going to have a great time together. Please come back. Be in prayer. These are some exciting days at First Baptist. And this is not a walk in the park. This is a challenge, and it's one that, uh, that our Spirit of God is up to. And today I want us to talk about what is it going to take for us to be on page with God and to be on page with one another as we follow Him in His plans. I believe, in, uh, to summarize that in one word, is unity. Unity. Unity is an interesting word. And uh, it's a concept that, that we, can have, we can experience in the earthly realm, but in the spiritual realm... It has even greater significance and importance in our church. I have been asking and leading and encouraging our church family 
to pray for four things as we prepare and we follow in this relocation endeavor. And the first and the most important was to pray for spiritual unity. So we're going to talk about that today because I think it's so appropriate that one, we're, we're going out as a faith in action today, we're celebrating baptism, celebrating the Lord's Supper, preparing to hear the update and the plans for relocating. It's so urgent and imperative that we understand unity. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. It's a passage of Scripture that's recorded in the New Testament that is the entire chapter 17 almost, except for one little phrase at the beginning, is the prayer of Jesus Christ. This is truly the Lord's Prayer. He is voicing this prayer, in the, we believe, in the neighborhood of the Garden of Gethsemane. He's already he's come together in the upper room. He is, uh, he is, he's uh, issued a new covenant to them in the Lord's Supper. He in turn promises them that he, when He leaves, He will send the Holy Spirit, that telling the disciples, you'll not be alone. I'm sending the Spirit to be a comforter, an encourager. He will guide you in your, in your obedience and the remaining of your time here in your assignment on earth. And then He comes to chapter 17 and we find that He is praying. And there's 650 prayers in the Bible. But this prayer is the Mount Everest of all of them because it is the prayer of God Himself. It's the prayer of God the Son. There are 19 times that the Gospel records Jesus praying, but none to the extent that we find in John chapter 17. So it's, a, it's, it's amazing. It's, I find it so a, a compelling that we have, then, we have a window into the heart, mind, and soul of Jesus and even just before He goes to the cross. Now notice, if we're not going to read the entire prayer. We'll only read a small portion. But I want to tell you, He prays for four people. He prays for Himself. He prays in the beginning. He says, God, I pray that I would return to the glory which I once had before I came to earth. Not for my glory, but for Your glory, O God. In essence, He's saying, God, Father, I pray that I'll be faithful and obedient to the very end for Your glory, for Your glory. He prays secondly for the disciples. He knows He has them in the upper room. He's already told them that one's going to deny Him, one's going to betray Him. And He essence knows that they're all going to abandon Him. And so He's, yes, he's saying, uh, God, I pray that You would hold these together. Keep them set apart. I have invested my life into these followers. And I pray that these disciples would be set apart. God, that they'd not be distracted by the worldly amusement and, the, and all the other things that can happen in their life. Keep them focused on the mission. Please, Father. And I understand that prayer of Jesus before He goes to the cross. He made a huge investment. And He's just praying, God, I pray that You would keep them set apart for the mission. Sanctified. And then thirdly, He prays for you. He prays for me. He looks down through time, and that's the part of the prayer we're going to look at. And he's praying for the church. He's praying, oh God, I pray that the believers who come to faith as a result of this mission and message would be one. They would be united. And so do you want to know what's on the heart of Jesus just before the cross? You are. I am. That we would be one. And notice the unity that He prays for. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing when we begin to open up this verse and we look at it. He's praying that we would be united as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit are in relationship and fellowship with one another in the triune Godhead. In essence, He says, God the Father, as you and I relate to one another, trust one another, respect one another, God, I pray that that would be the case in the church. Now, if you want to say, wow, <laughs> now's a good time to say that. All right, We're not very expressive here sometimes in our Baptist worship, but if you want to say, whoa, you mean He wants us to be like the triune Godhead? Yes. Is that impossible? No. Or He wouldn't have prayed for it. You see, all things are possible through Christ. And so He wants us to not only know we're at one with each other and with Him, but to live that way. And we're going to unpackage that today. And I hope and pray that it will be as much of a blessing to you as it was to me to consider 
this passage today. And, and by the way, the fourth per, per group of people he prays for is the world, the lost people. And he says, Father, I know that when I complete my assignment and disciples are set apart to do what they, the mission, and when the church is unified, then the world is going to be evangelized. The world's going to come to faith when the church rises up and unites together. And so that's my prayer for First Baptist. That's the prayer of our Savior. Would you join me by standing this morning as we read that portion of prayer in John 17, verse 20. John 17, verse 20 through 23, Jesus is praying for the church to be united. He says, I do not pray for these alone, talking about disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And I pray that's us, that's you, it's the church. Verse 21, that they all may be one, that they all, that all is all, and that's all that all means, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, we thank you today for the reading of your word. We pray that you'd gain... Uh, grant us understanding. But God, I pray even more than that, that we'd be a doer of your word today, that we'd know how you are moving in our life to apply this truth of being united in Christ and united together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's very obvious that when you read the passage that, that he's encouraging the church to pursue and desire unity. You see, it is the indispensable mandate on the heart of our Savior before He dies that we would be one. Now, as we begin to think about unity, there are several analogies that we find in Scripture that help us understand what does it really mean to be united in Christ and united as a, as a church. He used there several in, in the New Testament. There's the, there's the analogy... There's the analogy of an army. The church is like an army. The church is like the body with many parts. The church is like a bride. The church is like a building. And we have a blocks here symbolizing the building of the, each block being a member and, and coming together to be that building. The church is also a family. And that's the one we're going to look at in a moment today. And the church is a fellowship. But what we must understand as well that soldiers together make the army. Soldiers come together to make an army. A bride and a groom come together to make the marriage. Relatives come together to make a family. Bricks come together to make a building. Parts come together to make a body. People come together. People come together, united in Christ, to make a church. You see, not, not one soldier alone does not make an army. One person alone does not make a marriage. One relative alone does not make a family. One brick by itself does not constitute a building. One member does not make a body, nor will one person make and constitute the church or the family of God. You see, togetherness is the key to all these analogies. Even though they're like a diamond with many facets and there are some similarities about each one of those that I gave to you. But there are some differences, but the, the similarity is that togetherness, togetherness, the togetherness, the building, the body, the bride, the family, the, the fellowship, the army. God intends for His church to be together. And, and I want us to look at just one of those today, the family. The family. What does it mean to be united as a family of God? Because I believe if we could begin to understand that and pursue that, then we could be more in line with what God's prayer for us was in through the Lord Jesus Christ that we may be one. In 1 Timothy 3, in your sermon guide, there's a verse uplifting the concept of the family. 1 Timothy 3, Paul says to Timothy, although I hope I and come to you soon. I'm writing these things to you now that even if I'm delayed that you will know how to live. How to live in the family of God. I was at a home yesterday. Put your finger there real quick. I probably shouldn't have did that but I interrupt that reading but 
You can, you're, you're, a, you're a studious group. I know you can handle this interruption. I was in a home yesterday and they were having a wedding and, and one of the things I saw in their dining room was family rules. Family rules. And it talked about sharing, being kind, being nice. And maybe you have something like that on display in your life or your, your home or your family. But there's rules that we have in the family is what Paul is saying. And I'm writing so you'll know how to act in the family of God. And continue reading, he says... That family is the church of the living God, the support and foundation of the truth. So what Paul is saying, he says, Timothy, I'm writing to you that you'll have an understanding of how you should act, how you should live and behave in the church, the family of God. And I think sometimes that would be of great benefit that we understood. If we're the church, what is God's instructions? How can we promote unity? I believe, first of all, that we exhibit gladness in our family. Every home should be a place of gladness. Of gladness. The psalmist said in Psalms 122 verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. It should be our sentiment and our expression that we say, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go to First Baptist to worship together with the family of God. Our home, our church must be a place where we experience gladness. You see, home is a place where you want to go, where you want to be. It's a place where you know those that are there and you, you care for them and they care for you and you love them and they love you. Who wants to be a part of a home that's bickering and arguing and complaining? No one wants to be in a home or a family like that. Our church family must be a home where when people enter, they sense the spirit of gladness and the spirit of Christ in our midst. I'm thankful that God is blessing our congregation, that I'm glad to be here, and I pray that you're glad to be here. You see, when... We will, if we want to promote unity in the church, we should understand that we come and we can expect gladness, but I believe we should also be willing and, av- and available to also dispense gladness. There was a bumper sticker on a tr- uh, church years ago, I remember it said, Come expecting a blessing, depart having experienced one. Wouldn't it be great? That if we come today, that if we say, God, I'm coming expecting a blessing from you, and you know that you're going to depart having experienced one, but I want to take that slogan one step further. That I'm not only coming expecting a blessing, but I'm coming to encourage and dispense blessings to others. I want to be a blessing to you, and I pray it's your desire to be a blessing to me and one another. That should be the characteristic of our church home. As we promote unity, we want it to be a place of gladness. You remember the story of the three little bears? I tweaked it a little bit. There was Papa Bear was coming to the dining table, and Papa Bear said, Who's been eating my porridge? And it was all gone. And Baby Bear said, Yeah, somebody's been eating my porridge too, and it's all gone. And Mama Bear walks up behind Baby Bear and Papa Bear and kind of thumps them on the back of the head with a wooden spoon and says, Oh, hush up your yak yak. I haven't even poured the porridge yet. Sometimes our churches and our homes have yak yak. They do. And, and God help us to, to understand that we're human beings and there's no perfect home and no perfect church, but we need to realize that we must come to the place where we can disagree without being disagreeable. Your home, our church family, must be a place where we can share our concerns, share our fears, our victories, our ideas without becoming argumentative and condescending and critical of one another. That's how God intends for your home to be. That's how God intends for our church family to be. You know, one of the saddest testimonies in the history of the church is when a church experiences division. And you and I know as well, there's, we don't have to think very long. and We can remember or think about a church that maybe we were once a part of, or maybe a church in our community, our city, or maybe someone we read about in the paper, and they're having fights and feuds, and, and there's just a division going on in the church. Folks, I want to tell you, there's nothing more repulsive to the people outside of the church than when those who claim to love Christ and love one another act like heathens and rascals when they come together. That's not God's heart. God is never in it when we're, at devi- when we're divisive with one another and when we have that spirit of division about it's my way or you can hit the highway. That's not our church. That's not our heart. 
God, help us to be a church of gladness where we can expect gladness. Jesus said this in John 13, 35. Let me give you a new command. Love one another. In the same way I loved you, by the way, in the same way that I loved you, you love one another. If you want to say wow, this is a second good time to say wow. All right. Look what he says. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love you have for each other. You know what that means? That means we're going to have to come to a place where it's not my self interest, in my view, in my opinion, my knowledge, my rationale that trumps yours. But we come together as a body of believers, understanding that we're to love one another and love Christ. The unity and expect gladness. Here's the second thing about a family of God. If we want to promote unity here at First Baptist, we exhibit gladness. But secondly, we should, we should and must experience growth. Experience growth. You see, in a family, we expect, we expect people to grow. In your natural family, you know, if it's a, a normal natural family, if God's plan works that way, there's probably an infant and there's a progression. There's an infant, there's a child, there's a youth. A young adult and a mature adult. And in their natural home, you understand that, that little children or infants act like little children. They really, I mean, there are certain things that, that they can't know when they're an infant. When they're an infant, it's all about me. I want my bottle. I want my diaper. I want my nap. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't. I am the key, it's the key thing and that of an infant. And but when you go to a child, you start to teach them responsibility. You teach them certain things. You want to teach them how to be dependable. And you hope by the time they become a young person, they're exercising some choices. They're making some that are good and some that are bad. But you're wanting to teach them how to make wise choices to be obedient as a servant of God. And then when they become a young adult and an adult, they are then teachers of those principles. They're teachers, and they reproduce that. You want your infant to become a child, and by the natural process to become a, a, a youth, and then a young adult, and a mature adult, because you want grandbabies, all right? You want grandchildren, and you want, a, you want a legacy and a heritage that lives on. And you want that to happen. Well, in the spiritual world, that's true as well. We need to realize we we must experience growth in our, spirits, in our spiritual world. If we come together as a church and there's a new believer and they're acting and thinking a certain way, well, you know what? That's understandable. That's acceptable. They just prayed to receive Christ. They're growing in their understanding of what it means to die to themselves and to put the preference of others before themselves. But when you have believers who've been in a church family for years and decades and they have not grown, and they choose to exercise their wants, their desires, you got problems. you got problems. And so we should experience growth in our spiritual, in our church. If we want to see God bring unity to First Baptist Church, we need to work and desire and pray for gladness. And we must apply the opportunities God gives to us to grow in our faith. And by the way, this is one way, hearing the Word. But there's other ways that have proven to be beneficial and valuable. It's when you gather in small groups. The Bible has so many one another's that are mentioned. Share with one another, love one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, support with one another, minister to one another. Folks, there are so many one another's and you can't do those in here in this context. I really believe it's, it's imperative that we become a part of a small group, a Sunday school class, or some other smaller group where we're able to encourage one another and we're able to fulfill the commandments and the Word of God in our life and we begin to grow. There's accountability. It's exciting what God's doing in our church family this fall semester of discipleship classes. We have well and beyond. Over a hundred people have signed up to be a part of discipleship classes. Mind of Christ, Experiencing God, uh, Ladies Bible Studies, uh, Financial Peace. Over a hundred people. Folks, I want to tell you, in time, that will reap dividends. It will bring us to unity in the faith. Because God didn't create us and save us to sit and soak in a setting like this. He wants us to exercise and know our gifts, engage in ministry. You see, when, if we're a church family, then we grow. We grow 
numerically, but we also grow spiritually as well, qualitatively. You see, we must be willing. And see, in, in, in any given church, you've got babies, you've got young people, I mean uh, children, you've got young people, uh, young adults, and mature adults. But we must be in on, on a journey. Are you on that journey? Are you growing in your faith? Are you making yourself accountable in some small group? Well, I've already taken that course, Pastor. Well, good, take it again. <laughs> I'll have to take it again. Take it again and again and again. Put yourself in situations where you'll be held accountable. And because you, you, you see, when you go from uh, kindergarten to first grade and elementary and then to junior high and high school and college, the, the bar gets raised a little bit each time. But the thing about spiritual growth is you never get to the end of it. I want to say that again. You never get to the end of it. Because you know what? Who is at the end of it? It's that the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm sorry, in Ephesians 4 verse 13 in your sermon guide. He says this work, talking about spiritual growth, it must continue until we're all joined together in the same faith and in the same knowledge of the Son of God. We must become like a mature person growing until we become like Christ and have His perfection. If we want spiritual unity in our church, that means we should pray for it, but we must apply ourselves to opportunities to grow and encourage in our faith. That's exactly what that verse is saying. And so I believe God wants us to know we're to be a family. But lastly, quickly, not only must there be a place of gladness, a place of growth, it must be a place of grace. We need to excel in grace. Grace, that grace which has been given to us, we share with one another. Galatians 6.10 says, when we have the opportunity to help anyone, we should do it. But we should give special attention to those who are in the family of Believers, God wants us to know. That word opportunity is in the Greek word is kairos. Kairos is a distinct, definite period of time. It's not like chronos, which means seconds and minutes and things, are, and they go on and on and on. This kairos means there's a limited time. You see, my life has a limited time. The kairos, the, the, the period, the opportunity that I have, I should use it to do good. And if we're going to promote unity, we just must know that we're to be blessed by giving grace by the Father in our lives. And we're to be gracious with one another. 1 John 3 says, The way we know that we've been transferred from death to life is that we come to First Baptist Church and we fill in the blanks when the preacher, pastor preaches. Wait a minute. I don't know how that, that got up there. Let's try it again. The way we know we've been transferred, in other words, a believer from death to life, is that we love our brothers and our sisters. You're my brother. You're my sister. We're brothers and sisters in the faith. Jesus said, the world will know. The world will take notice when First Baptist Church unites in the Spirit. Because it will not be because they're building big buildings. They've got X amount of people in this class or that class. It will be when we love one another, when you unite together. God help us. May it be, God, may it be, Lord Jesus. It's a difficult journey. Because in order to be united in Christ, listen closely, you have to die to yourself. And no one's ready to, and willing to die unless we have an understanding of the Spirit of God, His plan and His blessings in our life. When we came to Christ, when you came to Christ, you said, Dear God, cleanse me and forgive me. I crown you as Lord of my life. You know what you in essence said? I'm Jesus, I'm dying to my worldly ambitions, my worldly pursuits. I'm making you the priority and passion of my life. That's how we find unity. That's where we'll find unity. And folks, I know that I know that I know that the greatest need at First Baptist Church in every church is to find spiritual unity. We are 
we are united in Christ perfectly, positionally, but we must now live that out practically. That's what he's saying. Put the interests of others before ourselves. Be a place of gladness. Be a place of growth and grace. The family of God. I'll fight for my family, even though my family may be maybe uh, uh, wrong in some occasions or maybe not right in everything, you love your family. And you stand up, protect, and care for your brothers and sisters. God help us to act like the children of God, the family of God. And so the world will take notice. Jesus is praying for that today. Would you join me by standing? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We come to a point of our service we call an invitation. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, if, if you're here today and you'd like to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, if, if the good news of Jesus Christ, if you'd like to have, be forgiven of your sins and begin that pathway of eternal life, I want to invite you to come and I'll pray with you. Steve will be up front. He'll pray with you. Or maybe you're here today and you saw the testimony of a Lindsay. She was baptized and you knew in your heart that that's what you need to do as well. I want to invite you to say yes to God today or whatever decision that God is prompting in your heart. For sure, He's asking us each to pray and practice unity in our lives. Father, we thank You today for Your Word, which is truth. Father, we pray today that You would unite us in that truth. You, you, you would unite us in Christ. And God, as we look out across this building today, I'm sure there's many things that You are speaking and I pray that whatever it is that we're hearing as believers today will say yes. And God, I pray that you'd call out those that may want to know you as Lord and Savior. Today would be the day that they would trust you. Father, whatever it is, we pray that we would say yes to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, this is your opportunity. Maybe you'd like to come to the altar and pray. But whatever you do, say yes to God today. And who are we? Oh, I weary. Come to the rock. Come to the fountain. And all who have sinned on the rivers of heart. Come to the sea Come on, be set free If you lead me, Lord, I will follow Where you lead me, Lord, I will go Come and hear me, Lord, I will follow Where you lead I will go. You may be seated. In a moment, we're going to begin our reservists of the Lord's Supper. If you're here as a guest today and, and uh, you, would, you would choose not to be a part of this, then you're welcome to dismiss yourself in just a moment. Uh, we practice open communion here at First Baptist. That means if you are a believer, uh, then you're invited to be a part of our celebration and observance of the Lord's Supper. Two things I want to say to you quickly is the logistics of what we're going to do today, because you notice the visuals are a little different. There's a cross and three tables. The way we're going to do that is rather than serve you, uh, we want you to come today, and we'll tell you and explain how to do that in just a moment. Each person will come to the, uh, the foot of the cross, and you'll get a, a, a dispenser of juice and that an element of bread. And, uh, and we want you to come and do that individuals as we all come together. And I'll explain how we do that in a moment. But if you're here today and you feel like you would rather not make that journey up here, our deacons are going to be available to give you, to serve you, if you'd rather not come forward to gather these elements. And, uh, and the way we're going to do it is, uh, after my prayer, <clears throat> we'll let uh, those in the balcony and those in the center section come. And maybe if you in the center section you'd come through this aisle, and then depart, return to your seat in this aisle. And then after center section is finished, the deacons will, uh, 
we'll, uh, we'll so let the two side sections know. And maybe uh, you could do the same thing. The side section, this side will come to this table center. All these tables will have the same elements. So the side, this side section will come and this side section will come at the same time. You'll just come to the different places in the cross and turn and go back to your seat. It's going to be a little bit different. And I wanted to explain to you the logistics of that to get that out of the way because I don't want you fretting over something and missing the message about what's, what is about to happen. Now here's the experience I want to tell you about. When you come, you're coming to the cross. Okay? I don't want you to think about that. You're coming to the place where He loved you and loved you completely. And I want you to think about that. What does that mean to you as a believer? That you're coming to the cross. And I want you to think that you're taking the juice and the bread as a symbol of His body and His blood. You may want to spend time at the altar and just say, thank you, God. Thank you. So you're coming as individuals. But I also want you to notice something else. There's going to be people coming and coming and coming. The entire church comes. And, and throughout the period of grace for 2,000 years, people have been coming to the cross to find hope, healing, unity, and forgiveness. I pray the Spirit of God moves in your heart that this becomes a worship experience today, not just another time of the Lord's Supper. Okay? I'm going to read to you a passage, and then I'll pray. And after I pray... The center section in the balcony can come. When you return to your seat, if you would please just be seated. Hold on to your elements of juice and bread. And after everyone has came to the cross and is seated, we'll then pray and take them together as the body, family of God. Jesus said this way, recorded by Matthew. He says, And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, He blessed it and He broke it. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, Take eat, this is my body. He took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, Drink from it all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for the many for the remissions of sins. I'm going to pray and our deacons will prepare the tables and you come through the, from the center balcony and then the two outer edges when they are done. And may the, Lord, may the Spirit of the Lord bless you today. Father, we thank You today for Your grace. Thank You for Your mercy. Thank You for Your body which was broken and Your blood which was spilt so that we might have full forgiveness. Father, we thank You for Your great testimony and example of love. And we pray that You would prepare our hearts today. And Father, if there's sin or broken relationships or other issues in our life, God, I pray Your Holy Spirit would just put Your finger on those and we could say, Oh God, forgive me. Cleanse me, Oh God. I want to be in fellowship with You. So God, I pray today that You'd be blessed. You'd be glorified as Your church loves and worships You today. In Jesus' name we pray.